Joining me now is Senator Rand Paul, who uh, had something before his Senate colleagues yesterday, which they uh, didn't act on. Uh, Senator Paul, uh, could you tell us what you were proposing yesterday and, and why your colleagues didn't run with it? Well, all week I've been trying to get the issue before the Senate, and I've been blocked at every turn. On Monday, I introduced legislation that would have stopped uh, refugees, immigrants, visitors, put them all on pause from about 30 countries. I think not just Syria. I'm concerned about 30 countries that have radical Islamic movements. And I'm also concerned about these visa waiver countries like our allies, France, England, Germany, that if you're a French citizen, um, you can just come over here without a visa. And the problem with that is, is most of the attackers in this thing recently were French citizens. So I think we have to have controls about who comes to visit us and make sure that they're not uh, coming under false pretenses. Uh, do you think that um, uh, that something needs to be done? Uh, well, let, let me start with it. The, the bill that went through the House yesterday, would you support that in the Senate? Yes, I think it goes part of the way. I want to go further than that, but I would support it because I think it's an initial step. They're looking at only refugees from Iraq and from Syria. I think we need to look at anyone coming from about 30 countries. So it's Iraq, Syria, and about 28 to 30 other countries. I also think we need to look at visa waiver countries, countries that are our allies but have active movements of radical Islam. France has got a huge problem. I mean, we're not talking about five or ten people. We're talking about the potential of thousands of French citizens who may be radicalized, and we need to have some checks and balances before they get on a plane to come over here. There is a proposal from President Hollande to the uh, French Parliament to uh, end dual citizenship in which he might strip French citizenship from uh, some of those radicalized people you're speaking of. Uh, would that solve the problem you worry about in a case like France? I think it uh, you know, might go a long way. That's where the real danger is, and I don't uh, presume to tell France what to do, but I do think if you're a French citizen and you want to come visit us, there has to be some security and some screening. We have something called Global Entry, which is like a frequent flyer program internationally. You go through a background check. I think if you're in France and you're a legitimate businessman or woman, I'd say go through global entry and do a background check, and then you should be able to fly really with great ease. And I think we should have travel and trade with it, particularly with our allies. But I think you have to have some kind of uh, screening process, and I think having a visa waiver is a mistake. And so I think there is growing momentum in the Senate and the House to say not only do we have to look at the refugee problem, let's look at the visa waiver countries and all the people who have the potential to travel to our country, and let's uh, put some controls on them. And Senator Paul, it, apparently uh, I didn't hear it, but I've read about it, that uh, speaking before a group of uh, students the other day, you, you said that looking back at uh, electronic communications after the Paris attack is BS, that it wouldn't do much good. Um, could you just explain what you meant by that? Well, there's this clamor right now between, you know, the Marco Rubios and Jeb Bushes of the world to say, oh, if we only had more spying on Americans, if we only had more surveillance with the NSA, we could have stopped this. Well, it's just not true. We still have the phone program. The, the program that the NSA has in place to collect all American phone records is still ongoing. It doesn't uh, end for another month or so. So for them to say that the reason we were attacked is because we reformed the NSA hasn't yet been reformed. And so we have a massive bulk collection of every American's phone records, and it isn't stopping attacks like this. France has the same thing. In France, they have something that's probably a thousandfold more intrusive, probably gathers a thousand times more information, and is in every scope of everyone's life over there and still didn't stop this. So what I'm for is more targeted uh, look at terrorists. I'm for looking at every record you can get if you have suspicion and you have a name. But I'm not for blanket surveillance or warrantless surveillance of all Americans. Apparently it's something of an issue in D.C. Uh, 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 now uh, between legislators such as yourself. I don't know if you personally are involved in this, but I know John McCain is and uh, Silicon Valley lawyers 
about encryption, uh, uh, unlockable encryption that exists on uh, Apple uh, phones and Android phones and other devices, including even PlayStation 4. And this was a result of the Snowden disclosures in which those companies said, all right, well, we can make it we can make it so that even if we are presented with a warrant from a judge, a legal warrant from a judge, we cannot access the communications of people using our systems. They're unlockable. Should those yeah, unlockable say, systems be illegal? Well, I would say it's not a response to Snowden. It's a response to Clapper. I mean, it's a response to the fact that they lied to us and said that they weren't collecting our phone records. And so now that we know that our government has and will lie to us about whether or not they're collecting our records, yes, people respond to that by wanting to have privacy. The problem with banning encryption is it would be like banning guns. The only people that would have the guns would be the, the terrorists and the, the, those who are acting illegally, and those of us who obey the law would be uh, prevented from having privacy on the Internet. The other problem with encryption is if you want to have the keys to encryption, you want to build a backdoor so the government can get involved and understand and look into encryption, that's a weakening of the code. And But what it does is it weakens the security of it. So the Chinese will want a way in, and they'll find a way in. Terrorists will find a backdoor also into our communications. Um, they're already hacking the CIA's email. So I don't really want government involved in banning encryption because I think then only the terrorists will use it and all the legitimate people who want to use it will be prevented from using it. Well, then the FISA court's out of business, essentially. I mean, it, a judge can issue a warrant and uh, show, the warrant shows up at the door of Apple or Google or whoever. I'm not just a, a sp specifying them. And it, they simply will say, sorry, it's impossible. And, and those warrants well, are, are then useless. But here's the problem. If it's peer-to-peer -peer and the knowledge of encryption is out there, this has been going on for a decade or more. The first discussion of terrorism and encryption was in 1997. Uh, so it is no secret that people have to either throw away their cell phones or encrypt their messages. And so this has been going on for decades now. This is not something new. But let's say tomorrow you make a law and you ban encryption. It's peer-to-peer. So anybody in the world that can come up with a, an application that can encrypt their uh, code, it, it's encrypted. Then it's just bits of data flowing through the Internet, and it's still going to be encrypted and unencrypted whether or not there's a law or not. It'll just be people who circumvent the law, but that'll be criminals and terrorists and the legitimate business people who want to have discussion of a transaction or a merger. They want to have that to be private. Um, or just people that want to have a private conversation. Or let's say you're a Chinese dissident and you don't want the government to know that you're criticizing them. I mean, this is a great tool for big government to invade uh, people who want to dissent. Well, what's the solution then? There isn't a great solution. Part of the solution, though, is that we should target our uh, – you know, our surveillance and everything we do towards people and towards individuals for whom we have suspicion. And I often use the example of the Boston bombers. If I'm the judge and I'm a great advocate of privacy and you come to me and you say, all right, this boy came from Chetnia. He's been back to Chetnia in the last year, and the Russians have given us reason to think that he might have been radicalized. And you ask me, will I give a warrant for his computer? I'm a hell yes. I'm an absolutely yes. And will I give you a warrant if you come to me and say he's talking to three people in Chetnia and he's talking to a, a radical imam in Pakistan? Absolutely, yes. We look at all of the records and we keep digging into it, but we do it individualized. That's what the Fourth Amendment calls for. Put their name on a warrant, suspicion, doesn't have to be proof, suspicion, suspicious behavior, and what you want to look at. And most judges will say yes. You can get information to the Fourth Amendment. I just don't want them collecting it in bulk on every American. Okay, so let me turn to the to the race. Uh, you are a presidential candidate. The two leaders, Donald Trump and Ben Carson, have made some uh, statements in the last 24 hours that uh, uh, are causing a little bit of a dust up. Trump says he'd keep a database on Muslims, and Ben Carson compared uh, terrorists uh, among the Muslim community as rabid dogs. You you don't hate all dogs. You just hate the rabid dogs. What has been your reaction to those uh, two statements from your two competitors? I don't think either Donald Trump or Ben Carson will end up being the nominee. And I think this goes further to evidence that we need to have a vetting process. 
and we shouldn't jump to a conclusion and say, oh, my goodness, it's one of these two because they are leading. I think the polls are liable to change significantly. I think there's, uh, you know, five or six or seven uh, people running for president who have a chance, and we should consider to continue to hear them out, have some debates. We've got two or three more debates before anybody votes. And frankly, I think we're going to have to count the votes because the polls are so bad. I mean, in Kentucky, they said the Republican was going to lose by five. One week before the election, he won by eight, 13 points off. So if the polls are off by 13 points in the last week of a campaign, imagine how far off they can be months and months out, particularly when you're polling undecided people who may well never vote. So uh, you you totally dismiss Donald Trump's uh, Muslim database idea. I think it goes against uh, everything we stand for to have a database on people based on their religion. Uh, we don't have a religious test for office, and we don't allow uh, prosecution or persecution of people based on their religion. Uh, so it's a foolish idea and, and goes against really everything America stands for. Let's talk about the president for just half a second, and then I know I've got to let you go. I appreciate your time. Uh, the president uh, is promised to veto that bill uh, that has gone through the House and is lecturing uh, Republicans about their apprehensions of a, a flow of Syrian refugees. What, what, what has been your response to him? I would remind the president that the Boston bombers were here as refugees. They were brought here, given free housing, free clothes, free education, and they turned out to be a threat to us and turned out to be mass murderers. Uh, two Iraqi refugees came under the refugee program to my town, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and promptly decided to buy Stinger missiles to attack us. When we investigated them further, we found out their fingerprints were already in a database because one of them had a fingerprint on a, on a bomb fragment in Iraq, and we didn't do very good at screening them. So when they tell us, oh, there's no risk of refugees being terrorists, well, one, there's a risk that they grow up to be terrorists, and there is also a risk that they're lying to us, and there is a risk that we aren't doing a good enough job screening them. So I will continue to push for reform on this, that we have to have, to order to have national security, you got to have border security, you got to know who's coming in to visit you. And this is a big issue, and I think will still be a big issue in the next presidential debate. Do you think President Obama should join with Vladimir Putin in fighting ISIS? Well, I think everyone needs to be fighting ISIS, and most particularly the people who ultimately are going to be part of the victory, uh, a big part of the victory. If it's going to be a lasting victory and a lasting peace, are going to have to be the Muslim nations that surround ISIS. ISIS is surrounded on all sides by, by basically enemies, but they're going to have to step up and do the fighting because we can defeat ISIS, we can take those cities back, but Sunni Muslim cities in Iraq are never going to tolerate American uh, troops. Uh, they're never going to tolerate Shiite troops, for that matter. It's going to have to be the people who live there are going to have to fight. We can't fight all their battles for them. We need to defend our country. We need to defend against any spread of ISIS. And we can be part of the final solution. But the ultimate solution, the boots on the ground, have to be Arab boots on the ground. Senator Rand Paul, a Republican candidate for president. Senator, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time today, and, and good luck. Thanks, John.